Omegiana Timuranda Sia, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Chekshu Militamia Natas Mai Shri Guruvena Maha, Shri Chaitanya Manobish Dam Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam, Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Utapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha, Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitantuam Sajivam, Sadvaitam Savadutam Purjana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita, Shri Vishakam Vitamscha, Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate, Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Rishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye, Vanchakao Patrubhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha, Patita Nam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadara, Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you. So, to tell you frankly, I wasn't sure what we would, how to play this second, second class. And um, <laughs> I was a bit exhausted, so I was just getting a little bit of a recharge. And then as I came down, I was speaking to one devotee. And um, he said something to me that kind of, um, it confirmed something that had popped into my mind. Because he was talking about the class we gave earlier, and he was talking about this, this dichotomy that we often experience between knowing or having so much information or knowledge, but then also how we actually take that and how we apply that and how we, how we make that part of us. It can be very frustrating as devotees if you hear so much and find that over time we still don't quite change. Can anyone relate to that? Or is it just me? Okay. So I was looking, I was actually, <laughs> earlier this year I was going to do a talk called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Devotees. So I was just trying to think or look at my observations of devotees who tend to be doing well and trying to understand what are these people doing differently to the other devotees that's giving them a certain edge or that's allowing them to kind of um, move forward in a way that is not typical of so many others. And um, it reminded me of something that we talk about at work. So one of my colleagues at work was sharing some, some studies around neuroscience. And according to neuroscience, which looks at how the brain works, how, how the neurons work, and so on, there's, there's, a, there's some research that suggests that your learning doesn't take place when you're doing the activity. Okay? That rather, our learning and our transformation takes place after the activity when we are reflecting on what we've done. And it, it brought back some memory of this point that oftentimes as devotee, we're so busy that what happens is you've heard so many different things and then we go on to something else. We've heard so many different things and we go on to something else. And that can go on for decades. And let's be very honest. How many of you know devotees who've been around for a very long time but their behavior isn't what you consider to be very good? Anyone had that experience? Yeah. And that question comes up again and again. But, but they've been around, for, they've been a devotee for so long. You know, so, but why are they behaving like this? So we were having that discussion earlier. That the transformative effect of Krishna consciousness is not based upon how many years you've been practicing. It's actually based upon how much we've digested the teachings. Right? So what I wanted to do, and this isn't going to be such a long session, because I'm also conscious we want to try and give you back some time. So we'll try and finish still closer to the time that was originally uh, marked out. But I... I want to try and plant two seeds, a few seeds in, in this discussion. The first thing I'd like to encourage all of us to do, I, and I can honestly say I try and do this, and you know, hopefully we've been doing it more over the last few years. I want to encourage all of us as devotees to do more to digest what, we've, what we hear. Right? So it's just like food. It's one thing to eat the food, Eating the food and digesting the food are not the same thing, right? 
So hearing the teachings and digesting the teachings are not actually the same thing. By hearing, you get something, undoubtedly, because the teachings themselves have their own potency. I remember um, when Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj was on the planet, this was after he was diagnosed with cancer, one of his big complaints about the community of devotees is he, he was concerned of seeing so many devotees not change. Right? That, was his, that was his big thing. I remember being with him one time. We were in Washington, D.C. He'd been diagnosed with cancer. There was no one else in the room. And he looked really, he looked really hurt, actually. And so he was sitting on the chair, and I was just sitting on the floor behind him. And it was after at Darshan. We, I think he'd given a class or something like that. And he was just looking forward, and he had a pained expression on his face. And he, he was just looking forward, and he just spoke out loud. He said, he said, does the spiritual master have to leave his body before the devotees become more serious? That's what he said. I was just there listening to him. I, I, what could I say to that? I didn't say anything. Right, but he said, he said, does the spiritual master have to leave? He just looked, he looked a bit disgusted, to be honest. He said, does the spiritual master have to leave his body before the devotees become more serious? And I was thinking, wh what can we do? What can we do to make that, to, to connect or to fill that gap? between what we hear and how we actually are. There are various things that can be done, actually. One is the, the power of good association. That makes a tremendous difference, you know? I, I, was, I was having this struggle, right, to kind of do my, my chanting properly with focus. And I remember I had a darshan with one Prabhupada disciple, very advanced devotee, and he told me something that completely changed the way I looked at it. He said to me, Buddha Bhavna, because I was asking him about this, I was inquiring, and he said to me, Buddha Bhavna, he said, what your mind is trying to tell you is that it needs a break. And, and it was a revelation for me because it was something that was completely outside of my conscious awareness. Had he not said that, I would never have come to that conclusion myself. No way at all. Right? And, and it got me thinking, this is what happens when you have good association. Ultimately, if we're sincere, what happens is Krishna will reveal things to you that you need to know in order to move forward. Right? So it's Krishna consciousness is a, it's a lot more it's a lot more nuanced, it's a lot more refined a process than is, obvi than is obvious. And in a similar vein, if we're gonna hear these things, the next question is how do I make sure this becomes part of me? And as we said, the neuroscience has said that the learning takes place not during the activity but how we reflect on the activity. So one of the ways in which we see that Maya plays a strong role in our movement is to make the devotees so busy and so unconscious that they have no time to think. Right? So then you hear a class, hear a class, hear a class, hear a class, read something, read something else, hear a class, read something else, while you're moving between different things, but no one's actually digested it you'll see a tremendous difference happen in our spiritual life if we start to arrange our lives, not only so we hear, but we actually start to reflect on these things. Again, I remember many times my spiritual master talking about the need for the devotees to take inventory. Right? From time to time to think, okay, how's this going? Right? How am I doing? You know, what, what am I doing well? You know, and, and what are the things that I need to give a bit more attention to change? It's, 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 it's the difference between night and day. So we always have an opportunity in Krishna consciousness to experience a greater quality of our Krishna consciousness. And one of the easiest ways by which we can do that is to make sure not only that we hear and learn, but we reflect on and apply. So shravana, manana, nididhyasana. We shravana, we hear something. Even then, try and get a proper understanding. Okay, you said that. How does that work? How would I apply that in this situation and why? Then manana, reflect on it, right? What does this mean for me? And a practice that I've been using over the years, which I found to be, I mean, at the time I didn't know how powerful it would be. But over years, as I've seen, it's kind of taken me on a completely different space in terms of my ability to kind of digest and understand things. Is that what I try to do when I'm reading is think, if I had to explain this to someone else, how would I explain that particular point? Because what it does is it then causes us to think about it, 
and to think, okay, how do I say this in my own language? How do I take this point and say it in a way that makes sense to you? We were, we were giving class in Vrindavan. And um, one of the points that came up was about how um, the material world, it, 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 has, it, it, it appears differently or it feels different according to levels of consciousness. Right? So someone who's a neophyte, someone who's a materialist, is just the material world. Okay? But to a pure devotee, you know, everything is Krishna's energy. They see Krishna everywhere. So the question comes up, well, how is that? So when I first heard that point, I was thinking, so how would I explain that point to someone else? And as I was meditating, I got some, some insight. So like in the world, you have these hot, um, these hot spas, right? So natural spas. So you have these places in the world where you have a natural um, reserve of hot, hot water, like geysers or whatever. And so it will come out of the earth at a certain point, and then that water will actually trickle down in a certain path, like let's say a stream. So what came to mind was that actually Krishna consciousness is similar in this sense, right? So you have the source of the water, okay? And when you're close to the source, that hot spa, you touch the water there, it feels hot. Make sense? But if you were further down from that particular stream of water and you touch the water further down, it feels what? Cold, right? It's the same stream of water. It's, a, it's coming from the same source, but it's experienced differently by different people based upon your proximity to the source. Make sense? So when someone is close to Krishna, right, the Sava Karana Karanam, when someone is close to the source, everything is experienced as spiritual, right? But when someone is far away from Krishna, far away from the source, that same thing is experienced in a different way. Right? So by the reflection, we, we start to kind of get deeper insight and realization, and it can start to become part of us. So there's a few things we could share, and we will kind of, seeing, depending on how we have time, we will actually just complete the other curses or the discussion. But more important, actually, than to just get more and more information or knowledge is to try and churn this a little bit. So we would like to start here, okay? Because we want to try and kickstart this attitude of reflection. It is one of the habits of highly effective devotees. When I look at devotees who are highly effective, I can see one of the constants, and it is, it is, I've observed this over decades, it's a constant. They've all carved out time in their life for manana. They've all carved out time in their life to reflect on what they've heard, on what they're doing, on what their service is. All right? So we're going to start there. We're going to give you about 10 minutes, and we want you to pair up with someone else in the room. And based upon maybe what, we've, what you've... Now let's, let's broaden this out. Based upon... Whatever you've heard so far in the retreat, okay, in your pairs, I want you to discuss with your partner what has stood out to you. That's one thing. And how would you start to apply that? Okay, so think of something that stood out to you that you think, you know what, I could apply this a bit more. This, and, and, and go to the point of saying, what are you going to do differently practically? Okay, we talked about this idea of applied spiritual technology, okay? So if we start to live this stuff, then we can see, th then you can, you can get a sense or a greater appreciation of just how powerful the philosophy is. When I, was, when I was in my early teens, I used to read a lot about personal development. And, and, and even in my day-to-day -day work, because we teach different things about leadership. And I can tell you honestly, the stuff that they teach out in the world, and these people are earning like millions, it's nothing compared to our teachings. I mean, honestly, I, I can tell you from experience, it's nothing. If they actually knew what was in our teachings, it would take their breath away, right? It would take their breath away because it's, it's far more deep, scientific, but they don't know enough to actually go and then, if otherwise, they would just look at the books and the stuff that we read day to day and don't really notice the, the significance of, they would look and think, this is absolutely incredible and they could repackage it and, and just go out and do amazing things. So again, the point I made earlier, we don't understand the value of what we've been given. But we want to try and digest the teachings a bit more. So we want to give you 10 minutes from the retreat so far, what has stood out to you? Right? And how would you apply this practically? Okay? 
And as you hear from your partner, also think and challenge if necessary or share some ideas. You know, well, I think you could apply it this way or another way you could do it is like this. But we want to get into that habit of the, of the four stages, shravana, hearing, manana, think. It's not enough to just hear. That's powerful. But if you really want to imbibe faster, we try to reflect on this, okay? Reflect on what we've heard. And how can I apply this in my life? How can I make this part of me? Yeah? Okay. And then we're going to reconvene. So about 10 minutes. In your pairs, you can work with whoever you like. You may want to work with someone that you do not know so well. One of the things which are amazing in Krishna consciousness is Krishna consciousness, and maybe you have a chance to do this, this retreat, Krishna consciousness is always a chance for spiritual networking. There's always time to speak to different devotees, find out what's happening in their yatra, what different preaching projects, what different initiatives, what we can learn, what we can do differently, what we can do better. Ten minutes to share your reflections and how you will apply them will go back. Over to you. Okay, so I'm going to ask for your attention again, please. So... I can see it was quite an engaging you know, discussion amongst the different people. We just want to encourage that. It's actually really useful if the devotees can, on a regular basis, take what they've learned and reflect on it. Take what they've learned, discuss it. Understand it in different ways from different people. I remember hearing in one lecture that oftentimes when we're sincerely trying to advance, Krishna will often use the people that we're revealing our minds to in order to give us certain answers that can help us to move forward in our, in our spiritual journey. Okay? Okay. So we're going to... So I'll just share a few other things and maybe just elaborate on a few additional points around the, um, the curses, the Ravana um, um, experience. <clears throat> so we talked before um, the break about the... Um, the interference or other than did in terms of the you know, Mount Kailash and how his um, arms were crushed um, due to Shiva pressing on the mountain and then he appeased Shiva and he also asked for Shiva's weapon and he received that weapon. Another curse that Ravana um, exposed himself to was due to the fact that as he was again on his travels he came across Ayodhya so we know that the entire you know pastime Ram's you know Ram's abode is Ayodhya. But Ravana came across Ayodhya on a previous occasion. And normally, I think Marge mentioned the point, Ram would consider that the humans were just a very weak race of people. So he wasn't, they weren't such a big deal uh, in terms of people who were fighting. But anyway, he decided that it could be interesting just to, um, just to go and cause some trouble, to wreak some havoc in the capital of the human beings. Okay, so he and his army, they fought against a king Whose name, is, whose name was Anaranya. And he was actually the king of Ayodhya at the time. And it was a very intense battle. One of the things about Ravana and his army is that those demons, they knew sorcery, they knew black magic, so they had all kinds of mystic abilities. Um, so in the battles with the soldiers or the army of Anaranya, eventually Ravana and his forces became victorious. Anaranya was the last person standing, basically. And the king himself had certain um, additional abilities because of his austerities and different practices. So he actually cursed, he used, he used the potency from his austerity to curse Ravana before he um, left his body. And he actually said to Ravana that in the very line that you deride, I mean the, the lineage, because Ravana was deriding the humans, you know, weak human beings. He said there will appear a king who will kill you and all of your race. And Marge mentioned earlier about how Ram appeared in a human-like form. Right? So the idea that, this, that the human race would be the cause of the downfall of this Rakshasha demon was very, very powerful and considered, therefore, human beings to be you know, ab you know, beyond his, um, his need to focus due to their lack of power. Moving further to that, that's just how intense the demoniac nature is. Ravan, at, at one point, while he was in the heavens, he saw an individual named Rumba. And again, a very attractive individual, and he actually um, pursued her. And so he was asking, he was inquiring, who are you, etc. And she explained 
that actually she was already married, okay? And she was married to Nalo Kuvera. And that Nalo Kuvera is actually one of the sons of Kuvera. And Kuvera is actually the brother of Ravana. So she was explained to you that there's no, you, you know, you can't, you shouldn't proposition me. I'm actually, I'm related to you, I'm family. Of course, Ravana didn't care. Okay, and that's the nature of demons. He didn't actually matter to him at all. What he actually did was um, he pursued her and he actually violently took advantage of her. So she was actually violently taken advantage of and her husband, Nala Kavera, obviously heard about what had happened. Now, it was very interesting here. He had an estimation of Ravana that this person is so powerful, I'm not going to be able to actually kill him. Okay, but he... But he cursed him. And he cursed him that it, the next time he forces himself upon a woman, he'll actually die. Okay? Now, of course, that curse, uh, Ravana heard about that curse over time. And this actually did stop him. He was, he was concerned that this actually could happen, right? Because he knew that sometimes curses can, can come true. And people may have the potency to make that curse a reality. So at that, so at that point onwards, he was actually very cautious not to do that again for fear that the actual curse would cause the end of his death. He further on in his travels, he came across Narada Muni. Now, this is also quite interesting. He wasn't, he wasn't actually fearful of Narada Muni. He had, he had some kind of like amiable disposition toward Narada Muni. Narada Muni is a very interesting character because he comes up in different pastimes and, and he's, he has a role to kind of sometimes uh, act as a catalyst to speed things up. So there was actually a very interesting conversation. Narada Muni wanted to steer Ravana away from fighting the human beings because he knew that Ravana being a very powerful Rakshashi could just really tear havoc into the human society. And, you know, so basically he started speaking philosophy to him and he told him, all these human beings, they all go to the abode of Yamaraj anyway, they all die eventually, so you know, it, it, it doesn't really make sense to fight them. He actually planted the seed of an idea in Ravana's mind. He actually said to him, if you conquer Yamaraj, though, right? <laughs> if, you, if you fight him, if you defeat Yamaraj, you've, you've conquered the entire universe. And Ravana really liked the idea. <laughs> he really liked the idea. So he actually took it on board. Narada Muni is interesting. It's explained that he knew that, that Ravana would not be able to con conquer Yamaraj. So it, it was, even though he was saying this, he knew that there wasn't an, a danger of Yamaraj actually being conquered. And he also, as we said, he wanted to distract um, Ravana away from attacking the human um, society. He also knew that if he actually got Ravana to move in the direction of, of attacking Yamaraj, that would increase Ravana's sinful activities, which would create the karma, which would lead to his ultimate destruction. It's a very interesting kind of calculation there, right? But if I get this person to fight this individual, they'll accrue so much negative reaction that they will ultimately be destroyed. Right? Very, very interesting. So he was actually directing him in that particular way. So Ravana went to Yamaloka yeah, in order to actually attack Yamaraj. And he, and he was causing such, there was such a, an intense fight and if you, like the description about, you know, spears and all different types of weapons and blood and so on. And the Yamadutas, I mean, they can fight. So it was a really intense, intense battle. One of the reasons why Yav Ravana was um, attacking the Yamadutas, because he wanted to draw Yamaraj out of wherever he was. So he knew that if you attack the Yamadutas, eventually Yamaraj will appear and then you can actually attack him. So he, he took this particular um, approach. And in the battle, at one point, he released Shiva's weapon in order to really to kind of wreak havoc into the, the Yamadutas in terms of the army. And at this point, Yamaraj appeared. And then the battle ensued. Yamaraj, it is said in the battle, he appeared. And on one side, um, there was a, a personality named Kaladanda, who is the infallible rod of death personified. So that actual rod is, has a form. And so he was on one side of, of Yamaraj. On the other side of Yamaraj was um, the very personification of time, the time spirit personified. So both personalities were there with Yamaraj and, they in, and ensued a, an intense battle again. Right? 
But what was happening was eventually the Amorites got the upper hand. And, and this is also very interesting. So at a certain point, he was going to kill Ravana. But then at that point, and, and this happened without Ravana knowing what was going on, Brahma appeared before Yamaraj. Yep. But he appeared in such a way that Yamaraj could see him, but Ravana couldn't see him. And Brahma explained to, um, Brahma explained to, Yav- to Yamaraj that he had given the boon to Ravana that he could only be killed, or he couldn't be killed by so many types of entity, right? So it was basically left just human beings as an, op- as an entity that could kill um, Ravana. And the idea was that because Ravana had been given that boon from Brahma, that actually therefore Yamaraj, in order to, um, to, what's the word I'm looking for? In order to verify that particular boon, that Yamaraj shouldn't kill him. So at that point, Yamaraj just disappeared from the environment. He just disappeared from the environment. Now this is also very interesting in terms of the mindset of a demon. So Yamaraj was about to kill Ravana. He had heard that actually this person is not going to be, you know, should, has got the boon, so you shouldn't kill him. So he disappeared. But Ravana, rather than thinking that I'm going to be killed by some other entity, etc., etc., his assumption was what? It won, yeah. His, his assumption, wrong assumption, was that this person's disappeared. That means I've won the, I've won the battle. So I'm, this, I'm in this supreme situation. There's, there's also a lesson here. There's also a lesson here. So in life, there's many situations where we don't really understand the real significance of something. And actually, it's very interesting. Even I was reflecting on how when we read the teachings, something really amazing happens in in the mind of a devotee. Our teachings are very broad. And there's many different statements in our teachings. What happens in the mind of a devotee is that some aspects of the teachings we give more emphasis to. And some aspects of the teachings we give less emphasis to. Now, there's two different ways that this plays out. At a more advanced stage, we give more emphasis or less emphasis based upon what we understand Krishna wants. But in the less advanced stage, we give more or less emphasis based upon our material attachments. So that's why Krishna consciousness, again, is very, very subtle. Because there's so many different aspects of the teaching. And oftentimes, there's more than one statement about a particular aspect of the philosophy. So sometimes when we emphasize a certain thing, the question is, why do you emphasize that part as opposed to something else? One of the things we often um, teach is unconscious bias. And as devotees, we also have some of that. We also have an unconscious bias. So there'll be some aspects of the teachings which will um, (laughs) condone something that we want to do anyway. right? So it's there. Prabhupada said you can do this, this, and this. Right, but that may not be the teaching that's relevant to us at this particular point, at this particular time in our lives. There may be another thing that Prabhupada says which is more relevant, but, but in the entire teaching, we emphasize one thing more than another. Yeah. So again, it, it requires purity in spiritual life. Without purity, without sincerity, as Prabhupada says, purity is a false, we can still take the wrong conclusion from the complete teaching. We can still take the wrong conclusion from the complete teaching. And that can lead us in the wrong direction. Ultimately, ultimately we're trying to please Krishna. That statement itself means a lot. It's not such a, it's not such an obvious thing. And the reason why it's not so obvious is because we don't really understand that when Krishna wants something of us, it's, it's in our own best interests. You see? We have our plan, and Krishna has his plan. And the reason why we don't move in, in the direction of Krishna's plan is because we still don't really understand that what he's saying that you should do is best for you. So our idea is that, well, I know Krishna wants me to do this, but I think I'll be happier if I do this. Yeah. But Krishna sees the entire picture. Krishna sees the entire picture. 
One of the most powerful things that we can do as devotees is therefore ask Krishna, please, you by your power, help me to surrender to your plan. Okay. Don't let me get in the way of your plan. Because if we, if, we, if we pray like that and develop that mentality, things will happen above and beyond our own capability. And it becomes an incredibly exciting experience. Right? So we have our plan. Krishna has his plan. And what we're trying to do is actually align in such a way that our plan is fully aligned with the plan and the desire of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay. Uh, so we can find out what Krishna wants through the spiritual master, right, by asking the spiritual master for guidance, by getting a proper understanding. We can also develop the mood. You see, it's, again, it's not theoretical. We can say that we love Krishna, but if we don't trust him, then it becomes a question mark. How much do you actually have faith in this person? Um, there was a morning walk. Prabhupada was there with his disciples. And at a particular point, he just stuck his cane in the ground. He said, the trouble is, he said, none of you have faith in Krishna. He said, none of you have faith in Krishna. And that is a problem. But at the same time, there are some things that we can do to, to move beyond that space. One of the things that we can do is reflect. We've all seen in our lives many times that there were situations where Krishna came through to help and assist us even beyond our own um, understanding. There are many times that have happened in our lives where you have needed something, you needed a situation, you needed an answer, you may have come to class, the answer just came in the class. Or you needed something, someone just came up to you and said, you know what, I had this, would you like it? And it's like, wow, that's just what I actually was looking for. We've all had those experiences with Krishna. And, and when we reflect and remember those points, then it can actually help us to have faith in the next step. When we reflect on how many times Krishna has come through for us in our current lives, it can give us faith to remember, yeah, he did help me. So therefore, if I trust him, why wouldn't he help me again? Huh? And then that, that moment by moment continuation helps us to develop surrender. Okay. Surrender means that we place ourselves in the hands of a person that we trust knows better than us what it will actually be in our ultimate well-being. In this particular pastime, or in these pastimes, it's interesting also, I'll just go back and share one other point, that Nalika Vera, he was distraught as to what happened to his wife, Rumba. But he also understood that actually, I'm not in a position to kill this demon. Okay? I don't have the strength or the capability to kill this demon. In other words, he was very, very clear in terms of his expectations of himself and, and the demon. When I was having this conversation, with one devotee earlier, we were just touching upon this point of expectations. What kills so many of, our, of us in terms of our enthusiasm for Krishna consciousness is that we in the association of devotees have the wrong expectation. Right? But they're a devotee. Why, why are they behaving like this? Right? You ever had that kind of question mark? Right, okay. Yeah. It's very interesting. When we do something wrong ourselves, we usually consider it to be situational. I'm a good person, really. I just hadn't had enough rest. I didn't have enough sleep. You know, I didn't, I didn't have some prashadam. That's why I shouted at so-and-so. Right? So if we do something wrong, it's situational. But if someone else does something wrong, it's characteristic. They're always like that. <laughs> right? They, they were born like that. You know? they, they, they're just terrible. They always, so we, we don't see things properly. We really don't see things properly. I, and this is something that's rife within our communities as well. And because we don't have the right understanding, again, this lack of Shastra check shoes, we don't see things properly, we don't have the right expectations, and that leads to an intense sense of disappointment and frustration in the association of Vaishnavas. So the relationship sometimes in the association of devotees is fragile. 
And it's fragile because we expect things of other people which is unrealistic. We expect things of the devotees which are also unrealistic. Completely unrealistic. And the more that we expect that, the, the further away from reality that expectation is, the more you feel hurt and disappointed and frustrated and upset when those expectations are not met. Right? Again, the, the science of relationships are there in the scriptures. And it has a lot to do with understanding, first of all, ourselves. Right? The more I understand myself, the more I can understand by that same index other people. And the more I can have a, a, a more refined expectation of other people, right, the easier it is to actually interact or deal properly. I was, um, I was speaking to one devotee family, and they were talking about the children and, and the relationships, because their children were in a relationship. And I was concerned, to be honest, because they were t the parents were talking about, you know, yes, you know, we, we were tolerant, you know, if, you just, if, the, if the couple are just tolerant, everything will be fine. And I'll be honest, I, I thought, that's, it's a good message. We should be tolerant. That's part of it. Tolerance is required in all relationships. But I have this conviction in my mind that for the younger generation, we really need to teach them to find people who are compatible in terms of relationships. And my reasoning is very, very simple. I look at my parents and I see that they were brought up in a society and in a culture where the lifestyle supported being more tolerant. I remember being young and, you know, there was no such thing as a mobile phone, right? So, you know, you wanted to call someone, you had to wait till you get, got home to call them because the phone was only at home, okay? Or, you know, you go to a phone box. That, that was it. If you want to call someone, you have to wait till you're at home and they are near a phone, and then you can have the phone call, right? And then I saw, when you look at it carefully, you see the modern society, everything is instant. So the world isn't neutral. So you have a society, a generation of people who've been brought up in a society where everything is instant. So what that does is it molds the psychology in a certain way. How does it mold the psychology? It molds the psychology to expect everything instantly. You see? So they're going to have, by, by definition, less tolerance of a situation which isn't so, uh, let's say, um, so um, nice, let's say. So, oh, but, you know, but my, you know, we did it when we were, you know, when we were young, we just, we just pushed through. But it's not, you're not young now, and that was 20, 30 years ago, right? So, again, Shastra checks shoes, right? If we understand the Shastras properly, then you can understand what you can and what you cannot expect of different groups of individuals. Right? So, and it's very easy to do this sometimes. We can, have our, we can have our head in the clouds and have our feet so far above the ground that what we're saying, what we're doing is completely unrealistic. So there's a need more and more to take the divine teachings and think, how does this apply in the here and now? So if, if I have children who are brought up in a, in a society where everything is instant, it's even more important that we make sure that they have a more compatible situation because they've been brought up unconsciously and unconsciously trained to expect everything immediately. So now you take these people who've had 20 years of expecting everything immediately and you tell them, just tolerate. Wonderful. Wonderful. We should say that, by the way, though. We should say that. But we should... You, one thing, it's one thing to say something, but how you arrange something else is, is different. It's very interesting. If you study Prabhupada's teachings and the way that he did things, you'll find something amazing. He would preach at a very high level, and he would plan and organize in a very realistic way. And it's a perfect, it's a perfect blend. right? So you teach people to go for a very high standard, but at the same time, you plan on the basis that they want. That was, it's genius. It's genius, because then, you, whatever the, the, the shortfall is between the ideal and where they are, you still catch everyone, right? So you preach, you're not the body, but you make sure the devotees have a good situation, that their health is good, that there's enough prashadam, there's space, perfect. So they will aspire towards the higher thing, but at the same time, whether they get to that level or not, you have this baseline 
situation which is completely necessary in order to take care of them. Right? And we often don't do that. Right? We'll preach the highest thing and we don't plan or, or, or arrange for anything that's, that's practical. Again, wrong expectation. Hmm? So our lives are not really, they're not built so much upon the reality. They're built upon our expectations of others. And if those expectations are realistic, you've got a great situation. Right? A great situation. If those expectations are unrealistic, you have trouble. Right? And in many cases, that trouble is of our own causing. Right? It really is of our own causing. Okay, the devotees, I, why, why are the devotees shouting at me? Why, aren't they, why don't they behave transcendentally? They, they're not meant to behave like that. I've read that in Prabhupada's books. The devotees are just meant to smile at me and tell me how wonderful I am. <laughs> really? Really, that's your expectation? There's a letter by Prabhupada saying you cannot expect a utopia. He says it explicitly. But again, that requires people to actually be in touch with the teachings. And because we're not in touch with the teachings, we actually don't know the philosophy. And that is a big problem. It's a big problem. Because by not knowing the philosophy deeply, it sets the wrong expectation. You'll see that most of the expectations devotees have is based upon their material conditioning. Very, and, and it's so subtle, the majority of the devotees aren't even conscious that that expectation is based upon their material conditioning. We were here a few years ago because we have this mentorship retreat every year with Sachin Anamaj, and I gave a seminar on personality types. And um, we were mentioning this particular point that Prabhupada says, what's that quote? Everyone sees the world from their own perspective. Do you remember that quote? The Sanskrit? Yes, that's it. Atmavam Manyate Jagat. Prabhupada says, everyone sees the world from their own perspective. So if you look very carefully, you'll see that the devotees who are more soft and more people-oriented, they assume that everyone should be like that. But that's just how devotees should be. We, we should be soft and, and care about people and nice to people, shouldn't we? Because that's how devotees should be. Well, that's how you are, actually. You're saying that because that's your material conditioning. And you're projecting now the way that you are and assuming that therefore everyone else should be that. And that's based upon a very subtle thing. It's based upon the idea that I am still the center of the universe. Because this is how I am, everyone should be. And you know what's so amazing? As we said, people aren't even conscious of it. Right? Not even conscious of it. Other devotees are, are very task-oriented. Devotees should get stuff done. You know, we can't be like this. We need, to, we need to get things done for Prabhupada. You're saying that because you're task-oriented. Right? And again, it's just your conditioning. And this blind side means... I, it doesn't even cross my mind that other people are hardwired in a way which is different to me. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Therefore, Prabhupada says, you must become conscious before you can become Krishna conscious. We're not conscious. Hmm? So these things fly beneath the radar, as they say. They fly beneath the level of conscious awareness that we have as devotees, and they become a source of difficulty and False expectation. So we want to leave you with this particular point. In Krishna consciousness, there are many opportunities for us to change how we see the world. Prabhupada says that Krishna consciousness means to see the world in the way that Krishna sees it. Prabhupada often speaks in sutras. He'll say something, when you dive into it, it's absolutely amazing and extraordinary what he's actually saying. Huh? Our sense of playing God is beneath the radar, right? So we'll say, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I pull other devotees first. Well, yeah, but really, unconsciously, it's all about you, right? But we're not conscious of it. So it's very innocently done, right? Why, and it's, you see this even in male-female relationships. Why can't, why can't my husband act like, well, he's a guy, right? This is how guys are hardwired. Deal with it. Okay, but my wife, you know, why does she have to always, you know, look pretty and dress up? She's a female, right? It's again, it's hardwired, right? So the idea is, if we want to move out of that, 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 that illusion in the world, we have, to, we have to work on this idea of getting ourselves out of the center. When we get ourselves out of the center, then you see people for who they are. I was involved in a project, and I'll end on this point. 
years ago, we were taking people on retreat in Mayapur. And in the team, there were, there were politics going on. And the team disbanded. And we went to have a darshan with Pankajangri. And I said to him, I said, what is the lesson that Krishna wants me to learn from this experience? And without batting an eyelid, the first thing he said to me, he said, Bhutta Bhavna, Krishna wants you to learn to... Um, um, he wants you to learn to have the right expectations of other people. Right? That's what he said to me. He wants you to learn to have the right expectations of others. And, and I always reflect on that. Yeah, that's what happens when we expand our consciousness a bit more. When we move out of this sense of being the center of the universe and think, actually, everyone is hardwired differently. Hardwired. It's not something that they, they're not just doing it. It's how it's their default way of behaving. And if, and if I don't understand that, then always throughout my life, relationships will be difficult. Huh? Because I've come in with the wrong expectation. And that expectation is me projecting the way I am and saying, because I'm like that, that's fine, that's perfect, that's correct. Everyone else should be like me. If we can turn that around as devotees, if we can have the right expectation of other people, of each other as devotees, based upon something deeper, this idea of understanding the natures of different people, and act accordingly, then you see your spiritual life and your relationships immediately flourish. Yeah. But it's unconscious. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to get ourselves out of that sense of being the center. Why are they acting like that? They shouldn't. Why not? Because I'm not like that. They shouldn't be like that. But they're not you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll stop there. It's 6.35. And I know that uh, people want to make sure people have enough time for dinner and so on. But um, we want to thank you. We hope we gave you some food for thought. Some of these things are deliberately given to, to challenge you, actually to challenge you and to get you to think a bit differently, to see the world differently. My generation, we did this, but okay, it's not your generation. You know, in my country, this is how we do it. Okay, but you're not in your country anymore. <laughs> Seriously. In other words, we are not the center of the universe. And the first law, or the first law that's broken if you want to have good relationships is to place yourself in the center. Relationships work when we get ourselves out of the center because the moment you're out of the center, you can see the other person for who they actually are. And as long as we're in the center, we will always expect that we are fine. We don't have to change. It's just the whole world should adjust a bit in order to be what I want it to be. And that will never work. Okay. So, we'll stop there. Shri Ram Navami Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Janita Gopramanandi. Hari Hari Gopramanandi.